Welcome again to the Dodcast. I'm your host, Luke Dodson, and Greg Moffat is my returning guest today. He is a journalist and broadcaster. He hosts the Legalized Freedom podcast, which you should definitely check out. And we are picking up on our previous conversation and talking about the topic of suicide. And as such, this episode does come with a content warning for those who may have sensitivities in that area. Now that was that was a really interesting uh, thought that came up towards the end of our discussion last time. You know, it was about this sort of like mass suicide, <clears throat> not just like you know Jonestown type thing, but you know just like a <laughs> planetary planetary wise because we did we have appeared uh, all too often as a species in the last couple of years appeared to be um, looking like we were um, deliberately self harming with a view to finishing ourselves off. Um, you know unconsciously perhaps but that you know those of us who are somewhat stood off to one side observing trying to fathom the insanity of it, insanity of it all have been saying well that's what this looks like you know this is not a this is not a collective that is is um, that is mentally stable at the moment yeah yeah absolutely uh, we, you can see that in the the rhetoric of movements like extinction rebellion um with the kind of morbid uh, focus on this is the last generation and we're all about to die and you know this is and and uh, Mary Harrington who I spoke to some some months back uh, raised a very interesting point which was that it's not really about climate change as such but it's more of something something deeper than that something more existential a sense of futility and hopelessness um i suppose looking at it from the the perspective of people like john michael greer and james howard Kunstler, it's the the sense of our our whole meaning in life is this endless progress that we've been sold and now that that's collapsing people are, are facing a sort of ontological and ex- existential crisis oh yeah this is very true um, and we will we, can, we will talk about meaning and purpose, um, lack thereof, or the quest for quite a lot during this session. I don't doubt because it's central to the question of suicide, as far as I'm concerned. But I think extinction rebellion and, and similar are are right to identify. That, you know, there's a fundamental problem here, but um, then forming a sort of apocalyptic death cult as a response is for me, is a way of just kind of, it, it, it's still another reflection of this idea of um, futility, pointlessness, lack of meaning. Um, so if materialist view of the world, materialist in both senses of the world, you know, way a cosmology and also a way of being on, in the world, uh, another word for it being consumerist, um, if, if that were to prevail, and then what John Michael Greer and James Howard, Howard Constable and others, Dmitry Orlov are talking about, then that, that will end badly in a material sense for us as a species. <clears throat> a lot of resource depletion, environmental degradation, um, systems failure, um, us being forced back to a more primitive, not Stone Age, but you know, more primitive ways of doing things, uh, technolo- technology going away, uh, a way of life that a lot of us would struggle with. Mm. But the, the Extinction Rebellion doesn't seem to have an answer that's much different to that really, or, you know, uh, an outcome that's really much different to that. It's just, uh, it's just kind of bringing it forward a little bit, I suppose. Um, you know, it's like a, a, a perverted, upended version of Greer's, um, you know, was um, collapse now and avoid the rush mm. idea. Which, you know, his, his philosophy of, of downsizing and simplifying your life in response to some of the big economic, environmental and energy supply problems that we're facing. Because if we're wanting the collective to do it, so we're waiting for that, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. But it could end up collectively happening kind of one by one. You know, they do say that uh, species or people go mad all at once and they regain their, their sanity one at a time. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the proposals also with Extinction Rebellion are very much focused on getting the government to do the thing that you want them to do uh, and outsource, in a way outsourcing our own 
agency and autonomy um and it's, a, it's an interesting one I, I wrote an article uh last no now it was two years ago it was about or rather a year and a half ago in the summer of 2020 about extinction rebellion kind of articulating some of the things that i found uh dubious and off-putting about them and some of the pushback that i received was along the lines of uh it, it's it's just selfish to tell people to make changes in their own life because what about all of those people in the third world xyz whatever it is that that can't and i i said well a lot of those people will probably find themselves in a much better position than us because if they don't have a lot of amenities already, if they're not already hooked in to the global infrastructure in quite the same way, they'll have much they will have much less far to, to fall. So they're, they're, they're actually quite potentially, uh, you can see some quite drastic reversals of fortune where people in the modern developed world, where all the wealth is concentrated currently, could find themselves really, really badly off. Um, and, you know, regions like uh, India and Africa, which historically, uh, West Africa, uh, like Mali, which historically have been extremely wealthy, would suddenly find themselves in a fairly good position. I, I think also that the sense of that there's a certain um, linearity in terms of how they perceive the climate, the climate changes is proceeding, that it's just a case of turning the thermostat up. And assuming if we take the assumption that there is some sort of warming trend uh, that could actually have some very non-linear effects across the whole world that some areas could get slightly cooler some areas could stay the same uh, in the the um, the, uh, the Holocene warm period is about 8,000 years ago as I understand it um, most of Africa was pretty much unchanged as it is now um, southern Europe was a bit colder. Northern Europe was warmer. So, yeah, you, you never really know um, how the how the the, the climate's going to develop anyway. So, I, I, but I, I think that there's there's a there's an to going back to this sort of sense of meaning and purpose that a lot of these people also have a sense of a, a global mission that everything has to be globalized now, and so there's a panicked and probably a little bit of a white savior complex as well as a kind of panic need to um, have a global solution for the global problem um and yeah to, to, yeah I, I suppose that is a a, a a kind of surrogate for some sort of spiritual meaning in in some way you're absolutely right i mean seeking um or rather seeking for the government governments or NGOs, you know, global organizations to take care of all this is what which is what they're purporting to do, and they've set themselves up to do and set out plans for. That just goes back to what I was saying a moment ago about thinking it has to happen on a collective level. Uh, this is not very likely to happen. We can see all the inertia in how these climate targets have been missed time and time again. And it seems that no matter what rhetoric there is out there and what you know charts and figures that climate scientists come up with. And no matter what the protests for or against anything happen to be, no matter how large they are, the same basic uh, cycle is run through each time with, you know, with climate summits and whatnot, which is a lot of, this is our last chance. Oh, we missed it. Well, next time will be the last chance. And, and that also overlaps with what you said about this linear idea about the climate. And I think that this, this kind of apocalyptic mindset, um, it's just part of human nature. It has been for for as long as we can see, really, you know, in, uh, well, back to prehistory, beyond which we don't know what the human mind was really like, what consciousness, how it really operated. But there's always been this sense of, like, doom and various, you know, um, uh, temporal markers have come up in human history where well, this was particularly um, exaggerated, you know. Uh, so, you know, the turn of each millennium, for example, uh, maybe, you know, collapse of empires, maybe when the Roman Empire was falling apart, certain people thought it was the end of the world. Um, 
the Black Plague might have been seen as the end of the world for many people. And this goes on and on. We saw it with the turn of, you know, from when, well, 1999 going into 2000 wasn't actually the turn of the millennium. It was 2000 at 2001. Nonetheless, there was all sorts of, you know, apocalyptic predictions around that. And then there was 2012. And then 2060 is another one in that sort of, you know, um, apocalyptic calendar. So you have all these kind of esoteric and mystical ideas overlapping with real world stuff, you know, very <clears throat> manifest problems that people don't see a way out of. But that sort of mindset is just, you know, that's just a human way of thinking. And as far as the planet goes, this idea of the planet will be fine. You know, it's got lots of scars. <clears throat> it's been through a lot worse than this. And um, the planet will be fine. There will be life on the planet. I, what it would take to extinguish all life, life on the planet, I'm not sure that we're capable of doing that, human beings. Mm. I think if all the nuclear weapons in the world were detonated at once and all the nuclear power stations then melted down, that wouldn't be the end of life on the planet. Um, it would be very different to how it is now, but life finds a way, life goes on, the Earth would still be here. So I think it's going to take some kind of cosmic event um, which you know astronomers have um, predicted to actually eradicate all life on Earth, and uh, that's a, that's a subject for another day, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I, topically enough, I was just reading James Lovelock's book on uh, practical science for uh, practical science for planetary medicine. I think Gaia. Um, uh, Lovelock is uh, Lovelock, someone I have some some doubts about, and certainly some of the things he's he's proclaimed but um he's a good writer uh and you know he, he explains science of ecology very well um it, basically the earth the earth sort of self-regulating system as you say has been through all kinds of very dramatic changes and, and it, it 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 really would take something like a massive increase of heat from the sun as will ev inevitably happen at some point many uh billions of years from now most likely i'm not sure of the exact prediction of the date but it's going to take a while um but it's interesting you bring up 2012 and these sort of millenarian ideas bringing it back to the topic of suicide one of my brother's past predictions was of a a cataclysmic event happening some point in the summer of 2012 he, he died in the autumn of 2011 and in the sort of delusional state that he was in, uh, had a very rapid psychotic breakdown. Uh, that one of one of my dad's friends, a psychiatrist, who now sadly has passed away himself, uh, who'd studied with R.D. Lang in the seventies, a very interesting guy called Mike Fielder, and um, he said he'd never heard of such a a rapid break from reality. And in the process of this break, my brother was talking about, uh, you know, an economic crash and taking money out of the banks and, um, you know, uh, escaping the city and uh, uh, all of this sort of stuff. And it was part of this general millenarian hysteria about 2012 that, that you mentioned. But there's something interesting about it was that as he mentioned the summer and was looking back, I never quite understood why. Maybe it was he was thinking about the Olympics and he was, you know, thinking of a sort of potential terrorist attack on the Olympics might happen. But now, with hindsight, looking at the what's happening at the moment with the global economic meltdown and the, you know, the sort of imminent threat of inflation and you know uh, financial collapse kind of all around us happening it's sort of a slow burn financial collapse happening uh, all over the place supply chains getting disrupted by all kinds of different mechanisms uh, and then looking back at the summer of 2012 and the olympics and that creepy opening ceremony or closing ceremony uh, which seemed to eerily predict a lot of the aspects of the contemporary kind of biomedical health crisis so there's an odd synchronicity there and this is something i've noticed with suicide in particular is that it seems to be a, a real magnet for synch synchronicity i don't know if that you found that yourself 
Well, just to address the thing about 2012, <clears throat> in my recent um, interview with Andy Thomas around his book, The New Heretics, which is all about conspiracy theories, why people believe them, what constitutes conspiracy theory, and the <clears throat> how to address or deal with the extreme division that we see now in society, you know, people completely polarised on so many subjects and unable to see any common ground and just demonising other people. Um, we basically came to the conclusion that <clears throat> 2012 wasn't nothing, it wasn't a damp squib, but it was more likely, as you've alluded to, the beginning of a, of a phase of transition. If you see, I mean, maybe not on 2012 itself, but there, there, obviously there were things in, in train before that, like the 2008 financial crash. So there were trends already there, but 2012 might have been, as I mentioned earlier, some kind of temporal marker or just a, an upping of the ante uh, in, you know, into a phase of which we're now, the last couple of years, uh, have seen a sort of heightened uh, frequency you know, of, of, that, of that phase. Yeah. Well, I think in our conversation also, we, we alluded to the, the Savile revelations and the, on, on the ensuing... Uh, uh, seeming beginning of some sort of revelation of, of elite child abuse in the British establishment. So there was a sense of something shifting. And, uh, you know, it wasn't quite the, it wasn't quite what it was <laughs> advertised in many quarters, but there is, there is that need, isn't there, for some cataclysmic shift, I think, in, in many people that, uh, I think it comes back to this sense of meaning and purpose that if one's dissatisfied with one's present circumstances, I definitely remember feeling this in the run up to the 2012 thing is that I sort of hoped that if everything changed, then somehow all the chips would land exactly where I'd want them. And I, that was the excitement of it. It was this sort of this possibility was in the air, you know, and um, I think that that yeah that comes from a, a a sense of dissatisfaction and a kind of a lack of meaning and purpose. But also potentially there was, you know, maybe there was some cosmic shift that the Mayans were alluding to. I don't know. Um, certainly there was a lot of self fulfilling prophecies of. You know, this is the time that everything's going to change and people start acting like it is and there's a sort of there's a buzz in the air then you're going to find sure enough that lots of things change and sure sure enough we're seeing a very different world <laughs> post 2012 uh now you know it, it's changed a little slower than some people thought but it, it still has changed in harry harrison's novel Make Room, Make Room, <clears throat> which was later made into the film Soylent Green right. with Charlton Heston. More, more people are probably familiar with the movie, but the book's very good and actually the ending's different. Um, spoiler alert, but I won't explain it. Um, so it's set in a world uh, written, it was either the 60s or 70s it was published, but predict, it's set in, set in the late 1990s in a world very much racked by the problems that we've been discussing and alluding to, but much worse, massive overpopulation, everyone crowded into densely packed cities. Um, the land has been, you know, sterilized. People are eating frankenfoods coming out of factories. Everything is just, there's water shortages. It's just crisis, crisis, crisis. Something's got to give. And the part of the core of the novel is actually a detective story set in this environment. But the reason I bring it up it's because towards the end of the novel, it's New Year 1999, and it's just about to flip over into the year 2000, and people are so desperate for change. You know, something's going to, maybe this will be it, you know, new millennium, even though it wasn't, as I explained earlier, technically. <laughs> something's got to give. Something's got to give. And then the, the clocks, I don't know whether it's in Central Square or whatever, uh, New York, <clears throat> they chime midnight. And everything's just the same. Well, of course it is. But, this, but something's got to change. It can't carry on like this. But it was like, well, gee, because it was going to like flip over from being one minute to midnight to midnight to one minute past. Why was that going to change anything? 
And when I first read that book back in the day, I remember thinking I'd already read about 2012 prophecies and whatnot, and you know, then about 1999, Y2K and everything else. And so I think that's what you're seeing a lot of now in extension, extension Rebellion and a lot of individuals as well. And this is why a lot of, I can imagine Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion sorry, I'm struggling to actually just say their name. I can imagine a subset of that group collectively committing suicide. I, could, I can see that happening. When I see them in those costumes, they look like characters out of um, The Mask of the Red Death. Mm. Vincent Price, Roger, Roger Corman's film, which is ironically about you know, a, a viral plague um, that eventually you know, is unleashed upon the, the peasants and eventually reach the elites. But so whether it's um, as a species wide in subgroups and death cults or individuals, I can see why a lot of people there are combinations of, of reasons, personal reasons, whatever, but all the subset of things, because suicide is complex. You know, it's rarely one thing. I think about 75% of those, you know, of, of cases will involve some kind of relationship breakup. But that by far is not saying that 75% of people commit suicide because a relationship broke up. Yeah. That's just, you know, maybe like a, a, a factor that pushes them over the edge. Um, so I can see why there's a lot of people who are at the end of their tether and this all ties back into what we're talking about, meaning and purpose. If you um, identify only with the body, um, only with the material world or with material things, then it's not perhaps easy, but you can see how some individuals re reach a tipping point and they, they will see no way out of that, even though there's always a way through. But the point is that um, it seems to me from limited personal experience without knowing a close friend who took their own life that there's a certain zone that people enter into when they're particularly vulnerable and rather than pretending that doesn't exist or ignoring them or hoping it will go away or not mention or not trying to talk to them about it for fear that might tip them over the edge that that's actually a window of opportunity mm. and I'm not sure I've not looked at any stats for increased suicides during the last couple of years you know as things have got worse for a lot of people people economically socially um and various other you know in, in terms of uh, being you know isolated and and also just general apprehension about the future so i don't have numbers to hand but you know anecdotally it, it is something that has been a problem one of the many pieces of collateral damage as a result of lockdowns and other dimensions of the pandemic response from from governments yes Absolutely. I've also I've heard anecdotal reports of um, you know ambulance drivers saying that they've never they'd never attended so many suicide attempts as, as as when the you know when the lockdown started. I've encountered a a woman whose whose son um, wandered off at the beginning of the lockdown and never came back. Um, and I I believe there's also there are some delayed statistics, so it looks like suicides actually went down in 2020 in some areas, um, but that's because the the shutdown of all these services made a backlog. So I think it, it it's probably um it's probably caught up since then, um, and th th there is a there is a, a sense of a a deadening in the air. I've found I've I've noticed even though that you know we're in we're both in the UK and it's quite liberal here, relaxed relatively, you know, they've they've lifted all official mandates and such like at the moment, as far as I'm aware from my from my last last uh, uh, announcement that I heard. Uh, nonetheless, you know, that there's a sense of a, a, um, a deadening yeah there's something something's missing from public life and um with, with with respect to the uh the issue of sort of relationships and that window of opportunity i i very much know what you're saying there so i remember in the the summer of 2011 before my brother died was having a conversation with him where he was contemplating getting back together with the, the girlfriend that he'd broken up with, I think the year previously, had a very toxic relationship with this woman. And she was kind of hounding him to get back together with him. 
and I couldn't I couldn't help myself I just went no don't don't do that Toby don't, don't that's a really bad idea don't, don't 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 go back there you don't want to go back there she's not good for you um and, and well you know what what, what else am I going to do you know what what who else am I going to find that's better? And I, I got quite sharp with him. I said, Toby, this is this is not the way to, to live your life. All right. This isn't, there's always someone better. You're a good guy. Yeah. You know, you've got a lot going for you. Um, he was, you know, he was sort of famous in his circle of friends for being, you know, fantastically good looking and competent at pretty much everything that he could put put, put his hand to. Um, and very intelligent and charming you know he had a he had an awful lot going for him um but he felt like maybe this woman was the best that he could do and um you know there was there was not much else to it and he 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 burst into tears and just ran out of the room i remember when, when i when i said that to him. Fuck. Yeah. who now um but that that i think I don't know if there's anything I could have said differently or in addition to that at that time, but it, it, that, that, that seemed to me in hindsight to be that, that indication that something was severely wrong and that maybe, uh, you know, if I had foreknowledge, perhaps I would have pushed a little bit further on that and waited till we both calmed down a bit and, gone back onto that and actually spoken about it what what's going on here you know why do you feel so hopeless about the future yeah it's the exact same <clears throat> type of experience um which with my friend <clears throat> who took his own life in 2006 and i related this in some detail in our our first talk so listeners can just find it there without running through the details point being was that there were signs there in hindsight that were obvious but because you don't believe you, you, suicide doesn't even cross your mind in respect of this person so therefore you just dismiss any of the signals that maybe um you know a medical professional or a psychotherapist might point out as risk factors and you, you don't see them that way because well it was, how could it be a risk factor to someone who would never ever dream of killing themselves so in that sense you know i, I can really resonate with the experience you had um, <clears throat> Rudolf Steiner um, had, had this to say about suicide. He said that in some ways, it's actually that suicide um, wants too much from life in a way that either they feel unable to fulfill all their material pleasures. And when I mention that, I think of Jason Horsley's brother, Sebastian. Jason is a person that we've both spoken with um, respectively in our, our sort of media outlets um, but also that it's quite simply and this is stating the obvious again Steiner said or that the the suicide has um, suffered some setback and you know which has left them again um, dissatisfied with life it's not that the the suicide doesn't want to live I think this is a common misconception is that they don't want to carry on with the life that they have and that's that's the opportunity if I can put it like that you know, OK, I get it. You know, you don't want the life that you have. What can we do about that? It's not that they actually want to die. Some people who take their own lives just want annihilation. But I was convinced of this of my friend, Sean, that if somehow he could have metaphorically counted to 10, or if, if I had had some inkling that he was capable of doing that to himself, that he could be here today, mm. thinking back, and as so many... Um, attempted suicides there are people who don't even attempt it but they absolutely have decided this is what they're going to do and then they don't they at, at some point they're like thank god i didn't do that oh my god i'm so glad i'm still alive you know and i think that so many people could reach that point if their circumstances were different if, if in order to allow that just that metaphorical counting to 10 you know just pause time out Mm. Mm. I think you're right that most suicides probably aren't it's, it's not exactly a will to annihilation it's a frustrated will to life and that 
you know that the accounts of these people often they're people with a great zest for life you know they're, they're really able to have fun and often very creative uh talented people as well um well you know just generally uh, gregarious um and and you know able to have a good laugh uh i don't know if you've read a book called the glastonbury romance by john cowper powers no i have not sure i've even heard of it it's an interesting book actually so cowper powers was a um, a poet and novelist sort of 1920s 30s his book a glastonbury romance is a kind of an epic mystical um novel with all these different characters all converging on glastonbury um and the the, the novel ends with a, a suicide and the the suicide is described in terms of it's not a will to death it, it's a it's a will to to life almost and that the character who uh finally does so at the end he does so with the conviction that this will you know this will intensify his experience of life and you know it's implied that he he may have a vision of the holy grail but it's never made entirely clear and so yeah that there's something there that it's it's hard it's hard to fully put into words as, as you say suicide is such a complex thing and it's often quite quite difficult to really put all of these often paradoxical com concepts into succinct verbal form but that you know the 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 will to eros and thanatos is the freudian thing there's something of both in them you know what you said about the glass and very thing reminded me a bit of the you know the, the romantic movements uh with byron and shelley and all that crowd <clears throat> and how life ended so tragically for so many people in that sort of that era i don't want to call it a movement but you know just those the people who were wanting to re-enchant the world and the life and the universe uh, you know a, a kind of reaction against the gathering sort of sterility ultimately of the enlightenment which brought its own advantages but as has left us in our, you know, thoroughly disenchanted universe that we live in now. And they, quite often through various methods, but quite often through some kind of substance, you know, nitrous oxide, you know, <laughs> alcohol, um, opium, whatever, they had a glimpse of another reality, of a higher reality, of another mode of existence, of something that they felt, you know, that felt was truly alive, was more real than real. And they really struggled and this was like a lot of drug users, they really struggled with the come down, which is what it would have been mm. coming back to this dead, dull, leaden, wooden reality. And they just couldn't cope with it, basically. But they wanted to be in that place all the time. Uh, for me, the lesson there is, and this obviously has been borne out, well, actually borne out by spiritual and mystical traditions going back millennia, but kind of lost sight of, you know, during the Enlightenment. But it's an increasing awakening in the modern era is that these states are available to us all the time mm. um, there might be a there might be a quick route to sort of a bit of it through some kind of substances but that some kind of realm of higher consciousness uh beyond our everyday five um sense waking reality 3d reality it is accessible it is accessible to us and this i'm just rereading colin wilson's little book uh, super consciousness because um, I felt the need to do it at this time and he speaks about that in there you know this his idea of faculty x you know this feeling it the surging feeling of something some something amazing beyond our immediate perception a feeling that everything is right with the world you know the very opposite of the um the suicidal drive and this is uh, faculty x was Wilson's version of Maslow's Abraham Maslow's um peak experience you know and it's like absurd good news. It's just feeling that everything's okay. And these, these experiences can actually be induced. So, but I think it very much depends on your underlying worldview. And if you can't see the world as absolutely devoid of meaning, purpose, if you see it, life as um, tragic and pointless, 
then that's going to really color how you see absolutely everything. I'd just be like putting on a pair of colored glasses of you know, and or, or instead of seeing things as they really are. Um, so they basically those states are accessible. So I know that's quite quite a lot of many points to, together in that little constellation of ideas, but I think that's a, a key to seeing the world differently. And I mentioned Rudolf Steiner, and he also spoke. And then maybe this is something we can get onto in a moment about the significance of suicide uh, for the parts of you that are spiritual and that there were, a time would come when people would recognize the significance of suicide to the point where there will be no more suicide because people will understand that the enormous implications there are beyond uh, beyond this life. It's interesting. I, I, I've not, I wasn't aware that Steiner had spoken about suicide actually. I think it's something he inevitably got onto because it, 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 he saw it as having enormous implications. You know, he writes about life before life, life after death, and all these other dimensions of reality. So how we come into this world, and how we live in this world, and how we go out of it, and whether we come back or not, are all central to his, you know, the anthroposophical perspective and his ideas of spiritual science, which seek to change the way we see the world. Mm. You know, but you don't have to know about Steiner or anthroposophy to... to comment on any of this or to think about it you know because there, there are ideas that he existed before he came along he's refined them and honed them you know they're, they're kind of eternal ideas in a way mm, mm. It is his take that um suicide if it was understood properly would be avoided because it it creates a sort of difficulty in the afterlife or in the you know in between life for those who perpetrate it yes because basically even with a sudden violent death, someone is run over by a train or a bus. Um, they meet with a fatal accident. There's still a, again, you have to buy into the idea here that there are, there is more to life, um, more to, to the consciousness extends beyond our life in this body on this planet. That it is in fact the, the underlying reality. So something of us in some form is eternal whether it has a an individuated sort of identity or not whether we you know whether luke or greg survive in any way the point is that there is a wider reality and at a death we transition to, to somewhere else sometime else you know somewhere else and um that that transition is significant so as i say even the violent death that's a relatively orderly you know violent accident is a relatively orderly transition from one state to another I think Steiner's idea was that a suicide, it's disorderly. And basically, um, the irony is that the person doing it may have had a materialist worldview and be very attached to material things and saw that their body as, you know, does them at all that there is. But upon committing suicide, that disorderly transition from life to death means that they kind of lose touch with their body in a way that someone who dies a natural death doesn't. You know, they suddenly lose touch with it and then will be kind of frantically searching for it um, because that's that's the thing, you know, that they identify with. Uh, whereas however you die, if it's natural, even even being shot, in, you know, in a battle as a soldier, uh, that from that point of view, it's, it didn't, it's not suicide. So you have that orderly transition from one state to another. So he's written quite a lot about this, but the idea, I think, is that if you take, this might not be, significant or important to to people watching who have got you know an interest in what makes people take their own lives or who have had have, you know suffered because of it you know in, in their own personal life um then this may not be terribly relevant but i think it's it is very very important um uh, to consider um if there is a uh, reality beyond the 3d five sense one then that obviously has to have enormous importance on how we, in, in terms of how we live and die. So, um, <clears throat> I, I, well, that's that's kind of it, really. It's just either you accept that reality, um, in which case you see the wider significance of what happens um, before we get here and after we leave, or you don't. Um, but that doesn't actually accepting the former helps make, but it makes more much more sense out of the journey of life and death. And it can actually make, it puts suicide in a different perspective. So 
it doesn't mean that, as I described, the, the difficulty in a life to death transition that a suicide might experience. Um, but that doesn't, that's not to condemn that person or anything like that. That's just the, the journey that they're on. Uh, they may just have um, experienced tremendous unnecessary suffering beyond this life as a result of that. But, you know, there, there's, there's, who knows what awaits any of us on the other side, as it were. So it's not condemning a suicide by expanding the, the vision of it out. It's just a wider understanding of life and death, which ultimately the whole point is to move human consciousness along so that we begin to see a bigger picture, which was, has always been there, of reality, so that we're less likely to see this as all there is and to end it all when either life doesn't meet our expectations or we hit adversity, which we all will. And one in five people, apparently, again, not my numbers, but one in five people will consider or at least think about suicide at some point during their lives. That's pretty damn significant. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, the sense of a reality beyond the body is interestingly something that was starting to develop in my brother's last year as as he had i can't remember exactly how much i went into the the detail of what happened last time we spoke um but but basically he had a a mystical trip while after taking some some hash of some kind some particularly strong hash that he smoked he was quite sensitive to cannabis and he had a kind of um a very hindu cosmological trip where there was a sense of the universe expanding and coming into being and then contracting and dissolving with each breath and it, this was terrifying for him it was completely overwhelming and um from that point onwards he he was he'd always been interested in spirituality but got particularly interested in sufism and was practicing certain sufi meditation techniques um unfortunately he was also doing so well occasionally having um the odd drug experience not not particularly frequently but enough and close together enough i don't know if he ever actually tried any meditation while stoned or anything but certainly there was around the same time he was meditating and actually having these sort of peak experiences um and then you know also partying with his friends and then getting a bit wasted and then that seemed to really completely unravel him um and so what his what he thought in his last moments maybe he thought that it was okay for him to to kill himself because there was something else uh i don't know i i, I have no idea but I, I asked John Michael Greer about uh, suicide and he said that it's it's kind of like showing up for an appointment really early and having ages to wait around in a waiting room that you've got an allotted time that you're going to go. And um, if you turn up early, then you, you just sort of like hanging around kind of twiddling your thumbs for a long time. It can be very uh, sort of disorientating for the person. Um, but he, he said that there are uh, lots of beings on the other side that are there to help people like that, which is what another another guy I met who has, you know, full on relationships with people who've passed over to the other side in his own experience, as he describes it. Um, very nice guy who lives in Glastonbury. Really, you know, um, chilled out, down to earth guy that, you know, you could have a you could have a beer with in the pub. And, um, and he'd, you know, be very happy to tell you about his experiences. Um, and he says that the, the same thing, that, that, there's, that there's a lot of uh, helpful entities on the other side, that they, they're there to meet people and just sort of talk them through it, um, the, you know, the new zone. Um, but that our thoughts about and prayers about that person are really important. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's about as optimistic a picture as I could 
as I could ask for, really. Um, and I have not had direct confirmation of of these kinds of metaphysical worldviews, but I I find them uh, interesting and and certainly plausible and you know useful models to work with. Um, and you know the the, the the sense that there is something it, it's not exactly it's not wise to commit suicide um and the other thing about that, that, that john michael greer said was that when once the person does incarnate again um and this will be they'll be ready once their natural lifespan has already passed so it could be quite a few years if they're young um they'll find themselves in exactly the same position in the new incarnation that they were the same same sorts of problems will will come up for them that they'll have to work through again and so it, it's not a like we were saying last time you know it's not an escape um and all the stuff that they were they were running away from or trying to run away from will will catch up with them again but perhaps with you know this time around it might slow them down but at, at least maybe they'll they'll remember oh yeah i remember this but from i kind of have a sense that there's something else i can do there's another option um i think that's a really important thing it just occurred to me now the sense of choice that you you have options in your life and i, I think the sense that there are no options that is that that's despair well, yes, suicide's an option. Not not taking your own life is an option. So, you know, straight away, your 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 option to take your own life shows that there are options. You know, it's just that if you think that's the only one, but if you can see that just not doing it is another option, and just realize that it is actually an option, mm. um, then that expands things out. Um, it well, it doubles your options, for example, and that might sound like a bit of a trite way of putting it for someone who's in the depths of despair but that's where that's where other ways of looking at the world or maybe even other individuals can, can help out you know and that's where i think as a species if we weren't infected with this um plague of, of meaninglessness that there, there would be a lot less people taking their own lives because they just would see the world in a different way i mean as for the existence of um other realms you, you, which you just spoke about you said you had no direct experience that's fine, but it is borne out, even though we don't understand what really is beyond this reality that you and I are sharing now, it's a very narrow bandwidth. We don't, can't explain it, but the fact that there is something there is borne out by all of human experience over all, all of the human, uh, you know, all human existence. It might be, it's written down and it might be all anecdotal, but it's still the bulk of human experience. The people who are most adamant that nothing like that could possibly exist are people with no experience of it. You know, they've never had a transcendental experience. Uh, you know, think of people who had near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences. Um, some of them really hardened skeptics, hardened materialists. They've come back and it's completely revolutionized their view of the world. So the people who are most adamant that these things are all nonsense are people who have never had an experience like that in themselves, and they don't give any credence to anyone else's subjective experience, all the other millions and billions of people down millennia who've had these experiences, they just write it all off because it can't be measured in a lab, it can't be weighed, it can't be dissected, it can't be divided by three or whatever it happens to be. Um, a word about synchronicities and suicide. I'm, I'm glad you used the word synchronicity because I've been reflecting on what we talked about in our previous conversation, thinking about having this one because you suggested maybe the overarching topic of suicide would be would be a meaningful one to have. <clears throat> and I was walking past a mid, small medieval church that I walk past almost every day. And this was a few weeks ago and it's uh, still very cold. And I was walking along one side of the road and I just happened to look up at the churchyard and an image struck me right there. And I stopped to take a photograph of it because I had to. And it was a load of graves at the back of the graveyard, a big row of them some centuries gone by and in the foreground under a big tree one single snowdrop one single snowdrop now that particular graveyard fills with snowdrops and crocuses in spring 
but there was one single snowdrop there. So I've got a photograph of that in the foreground of the graves in the background. I just called it death and rebirth. And it, actually it was on New Year's Day that I took it, it was January the 1st. I was walking into, into town early in, on New Year's Day. And it, it, the significance of it was just, it, was, it really was synchronous to me. It spoke to me and that's the whole point of synchronicities. Other people might say, I didn't notice the graveyard. I didn't notice the snowdrop. But for me, there was life, death, rebirth. The whole cycle was there represented represented in one thing. And by the way, that snowdrop is now gone and none of the others have come up in the graveyard. So that one snowdrop came up just for a few days and then went away. On the other side of the road at the same time, just before I stopped to take this photograph, there was a sign at a bus stop and it just had in huge letters, stay. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, that has that all this ties together because what that means is don't go away, stay. And I thought about it in the context of suicide. Now, later the same day at night, I was walking, I never crossed the road to look at this sign, by the way. I was walking in the opposite direction and I went past another bus stop and I saw the same sign, stay. And it's only when I walked right up to it, I realized it was about a campaign for men's mental health and suicide. I did not know that in the morning when I took the photograph of the snowdrop in the graveyard. I just saw the stay across there and I tied it to suicide or staying alive, you know, getting through it. And so there it was, it's a sign posted about a men's mental health campaign. Now, that was all positive synchronicity around these ideas for me. When someone's contemplating suicide, they're deep into that process, they actually start, ironically, they start to find meaning in events around them or they can do. They see synchronicities that start to confirm the fact that to, to die is the only thing for them. Mm. Silly things like a cloudy day, so they stub their toe, someone's a bit nasty to them, something, something, some little thing doesn't work out. It all gets added into the equation, the saying there's no, this is just confirming that, that I'm doing the right thing here. And I don't know if your brother could have experienced any of this, but sometimes they can start to see evidence for like negative synchronicities, evidence for the fact that there's only one course of action because X, you know. I um I went to the, the graveyard today where my brother's buried and I, I took him a single snowdrop in a little cup. Um so it, it's odd that <laughs> it's odd that you mentioned that uh today as well. It it was a kind of a spontaneous uh a spontaneous ritual uh, coinciding with with the day of Imolk, the sort of you know, the first first little buddings of spring. Um that's a that's a that's a wonderful story uh, that, that that you relayed. Um, my experience with that the the kind of negative synchronicities is is one of when I was in my sort of depth of suicidal ideation in my mid teens, I started to notice signs in the media of the films and tv programs that i'd watch that would confirm the sense that i had that uh i had ended up in the wrong stream of reality somehow and that the only way to get out of it was death and preferably not having to do it myself because i wasn't really keen on the idea of having to take my own life that never that bit never appealed to me that, that just seemed like scary and a lot of hassle and uh, quite a quite a risky gambit. But the idea of like just life taking me out um, without me having to you know worry about it that really that was a narrative that played out played itself out in my head a lot. And this came about originally from watching Donnie Darko when I on my fifteenth birthday actually I, I saw Donnie Darko. And it sort of kind of went underground into my unconscious for about six months. And then my first sort of major breakdown happened, which may have been exacerbated by uh, hash. I don't know. It certainly happened when I was quite stoned. And I had a very strange kind of nervous breakdown mixed with sort of paranoid trip and you know that the, the narrative of Donnie Darko came back to me 
more and more in the months that came up after that of the sense that you know this this kid who realizes that some flaw has some error has occurred in the wiring of reality and he has to uh, find a way to kind of end that particular stream and just get back to the proper one and, and it, he does so um, through his own death where he, he he I can't really remember exactly how but he um, he has the presence of mind on the next time around to avoid being hit by the the airplane engine that that, uh, that that crashes into the house and um I, I started to see this kind of narrative all over the place really weird because i never saw it before then and i haven't really seen it since then but i saw all these other kind of movies and tv shows that had the same sort of idea um there was a series called do over where the guy didn't die but he, he basically went back to his teenage years in the 80s and sort of redid his life he had a chance to start again and um other things other other sort of indications like that so it was like there was some trickster element whether that's in my psyche or in reality um or a mixture of both or even the differences between the two i can't say for sure but something was was finding these messages and that was confirming the sense that yeah there's something wrong here and i might have to i might have to you know take a leap of faith and just end it all if it really just seems certain that that's the right thing to do so yeah i've i've had i've had experience of 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 that as well I think those impulses are an indication ultimately that you need to do something other than take your own life. But of course, <clears throat> that's easy to say in retrospect. Um, I read somewhere that suicide can be a bit like um, a rite of passage gone wrong. And it occurred to me when I, in, in the light of that, thinking about the age groups of suicide risk and indeed suicides in Western societies, you know, the sort of the, the ones that you and I live in, and probably many people watching this, is that many of those, what historically, you know, those rites of passage, um, in whatever sort of society you live in, they've kind of gone away, you know, with a, with a sort of atomization of families and, and social structures and, and what have you, and a lot of these things being seen as somewhat archaic. Um, so, and uh, indigenous societies would they have it in their sorts of rites of passages and their initiations you know from one phase of life to another particularly from childhood into adulthood which i think is so important and we don't have anything like that now you know teenagers just left to do their own thing and you've got that the high risk group in our societies is from 15 to 30 it's also 70 and above but for for quite different reasons from 15 to 30 and that covers more than just teenage years or more than just you know becoming an adult or what they call failure to launch, you know, failing to become an adult. But with the increasing infantilization of young people, not often through any fault of their own, but just through what society's feeding us and what the media is feeding us, it's not uncommon for people to be living with their parents when they're 30, you know, and they've never lived anywhere else, you know, to not have a job and to be smoking weed and to be playing computer games. Yeah. You see this in the Hikikomori uh, phenomenon in Japan, Again, but for socioeconomic reasons, and, and those are factors, but I think this lack of initi initiatory rights is potentially important here. And that uh, people only get into a suicidal corner. It can be, they're, they're trying to make a transition or they need to make a transition. You know, they're, they're, they're at a, a point, you know, they've reached a, a, um, a block in their progress or lack of it, you know, and there's something there that they need to push through, but they don't understand it. Society doesn't really understand it. It's not catered for. It's not looked to. And there's usually, even in the best of families, there usually maybe isn't like an elder member of the family with one eye of their own experience and the experience of these younger men and women. You know, what is this, what does this time call for? You know, how, how are they, all right, the world has changed, you know, since our fathers and grandfathers' generations, but certain fundamental things are still the same. We still require as human beings many of the same experiences um, as we are, always have had, 
Um, but we have them in the context of the society that, that we're living in at the time. But those fundamental needs haven't changed. So to say that you don't need that sense of, of, of bonding with, you know, your father, your grandfather, your mother, your grandmother, whatever it happens to be with your brother, there are these societal structures and groupings that these things somehow don't matter in an age where we're all locked away in our own, you know, surfing the net with a load of quote unquote friends, none of whom we've, we've ever met or will ever meet. That's somehow a substitute. It's not. And a lot of this could contribute towards, and if you Google, you know, the internet and suicide, you see that the huge problem that this creates. Of course, it all moves, in, you know, increasing numbers of people, to, especially younger people, towards this just dead end where they, they, some of them will see a way through, they'll decide to make a change. But for many people, that they, there's nothing that, that seems to be on offer, you know, because the baseline reality they're living in is apparently has no meaning, no purpose. And it's just about getting stuff and being stuff. And if you don't have stuff and, you know, and you're not important or you're not esteemed or whatever, even though all those things don't stop people taking their own lives. But for some people, they view it that way. I'm a failure at life. I don't know how to move forward. And you see that there's even the, the psychology of uh, coping with extreme poverty is basically the same set of tools as um, coping with extreme wealth. <laughs> basically the same thing. Right. You know? Interesting. Hmm. I, I think this, this is a really crucial factor, uh, the, the lack of initiatory rights. You know, I, I, I think this is these these traditions that they, they vary very widely. Um, you know, some of them are more formalized than others. Some of them are more brutal than others. You know, um, the, the Amazon tribe where they have the fire ants kind of strapped to their hand is a particularly extreme example. But there's, you know, there's also got kind of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs in the Jewish tra Jewish tradition, uh, which marks something as well. Um, and, you know, there's a huge variety of these things, but they're all very important. And, and I think that there's a, a lack of that and a lack of a, a sense of an initiation into the, you know, a, the, the mysteries of nature and, the, you know, the mysteries of, of the inner nature as well as the outer nature. Uh, and, uh, you know, a marking of this is a, a distinct phase of life now. Uh, and that is, you know, that's a really crucial point. Something I, I was interested to get your take on is why, why do you think it could be that, generally speaking, it's been much higher, uh, there have been much higher suicide rates among men than women. I know that it's rising in women now for the first time pretty much ever as i understand but still pretty much i think it's about three quarters um three quarters to a quarter the ratio of of male to female suicides it was a little bit less than that for, for a long time you're right it is slightly on the increase and i think actually there's more female suicides in china than there are male suicides hmm, interesting no doubt there's um you know social cultural reasons for that um it may, it may be to do with um, emotional intelligence or, you know, an ability to express emotions. Um, that that's, would be my, off the top of my head, answer, you know, just how women are in their way of being for the most part, uh, as opposed to men. Uh, and here we'd be looking to what many would see as more traditional male and female role models. So men are supposed to be strong and stoic. Uh, not really display their emotions, um, take everything that's thrown at them. No, you know, blubbering and crying, no whinging, just get on with it, be strong, be there for everybody. And it's not that women can't be or aren't all of those things. But again, a, a more traditional role would see women as more able to express their emotions, more able to open up to each other, you know, to the other women. And under traditionally got to emphasize that under somewhat less of the pressures you know economic maybe or otherwise and of course that has been changing over the last few decades so i've been interested to hear anyone who really understands psychology changes in society and suicide risk to, to, to put some details on that but essentially i would see that as the roots of it just different uh rules direct different expectations in society and um different you know what people become used to in terms of what they feel they can speak about and what they can't speak about because there's there's fundamental differences 
to how men and women's brains are wired. Um, as much as we have in common, human beings, you know, there are there are certain fundamental differences, no question about that. Mm, absolutely, yeah. And, and I think a, a lot of the time there's different forms of emotional processing too that, that go on. So I, I think that I, I can see some of the... Uh, the campaigns to kind of encourage men to talk about their feelings more right i see they have a, a a good intention and you know maybe in some cases they have some uh some good results uh i, I know there have been some um campaigns to do with male suicide that have actually decreased the the suicide rates in certain local areas so that i don't know exactly what techniques they were using but a lot of the time i think that there is you know um there are these events, uh, you know, about encouraging men to to kind of open up and talk about their feelings and such like, and um, a lot of them are kind of mostly attended by women, and so it's kind of not doesn't seem to be very popular among men. And I speak as someone who's had experiences of psychotherapy myself, um, that I think sometimes it can be a bit a, a bit more useful for men to kind of express their emotions in a in a uh, a context of competing completing a shared task together uh, and that that sort of that sense of trust and bonding can then uh, open up the way for a, a um, more you know perhaps more verbal sharing uh, and even more kind of you know actually getting out some of that emotional charge in the process of uh, of, of of doing something you know like Putting, putting there's some, putting together there's some really sorry i didn't mean to interrupt there's some really fascinating intermeal dynamics in a couple of my favorite films from the 70s uh, i'm smiling just because like it's sort of darkly comic at some points but just highlighting just some of the ways that you know men interact in in, in small groups when they're doing particularly physical things and women are not around you know um, you see this in a micro scale of a few guys get together at a social gathering and they go out to the garden to light the barbecue and the women are inside making the salad. <laughs> Cliche alert, but you know, this dynamic starts already. And these two movies are, there's one called, they're both dark, violent movies. One's called Deliverance uh, by John Borman. And this features a small group of city guys who go deep into a wilderness on a hunting, fishing and outdoors kind of expedition. And their skills range they were quite different guys, but their skills range from the very competent outdoorsman who's got all the all the requisite skills through to like there's four of them. One guy who's you know doesn't really know what he's doing. He's just along because this is an exciting thing for guys to do do together. Um, as I say, there's some awful violent tragedy in that film, but the interesting bits for me are watching these guys interact with each other when things are going well and when they turn nasty. And then there's also um, the deer hunter which is a, a very famous film about the Vietnam War. And it's when the guys go together into the, again, into the wilderness on a deer hunt. And it's all their interactions together um, in that sort of, again, in both Deliverance and the Deer Hunter to a greater extent or less, they're pitted against nature in some way. And I think that's very interesting because it's like this archetypal environment for a male challenge and then just and it, it puts pressure on them in terms of their interactions. So they're forced to interact more with each other or to be more emotional or not. So there was, they just popped into my head because I find it difficult to get through any talk without giving pop culture references. I just so something that I do, you know, I just think it's an interesting lens to look at things through. So, yeah, even if you just go on YouTube and pull up some clips, it's just fascinating watching small groups of men doing what they do. Um, challenging themselves when, say, when it's an all male environment. I, I know, I know the film Deliverance. Uh, I've, I've, I've never actually watched it, but my um, my great uncle edited it, and um, so he was out there with with when they were filming it. And um, anecdotally, the um, the scene where the the little kids playing the banjo, the dueling banjos with the other guy, that that actor he had another guy behind him whose hands were playing the banjo that he was playing on that one. So that's how they shot that. Basically, they had like a master banjo player that was playing the banjo for this guy. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, it, I, I think it's, it's, 
it's true it is a very archetypal uh, experience and like something like a film like deliverance kind of shows that the sort of the the darkest possible uh uh kind of uh, result of that <laughs> of that archetypal that having known female friends over the years when they've hit rock bottom and been in really difficult times I'm generalizing here, so I'm not thinking of any specific conversation, but a conversation with um, a woman having a really difficult time and the idea of suicide, generally it would be, oh, no, no, I, I could never do anything like that. You know, think of other people. You know, I would never do that to my family and friends. You know, I, that's not what I want. You know, there's always a way through it. You know, that I would never do that. It's the ultimate act of selfishness. And they would see themselves still not in all cases, but again, and just in my experience, ultimately is not completely alone. And thinking about the same types of conversations with men is that they would understand what suicide leaves behind up to a point, but they would see themselves in that moment as utterly alone. You know, and that there was, this was like, there was, there just was no, it just completely blinkered. And, uh, you know, just alone in this world, alone in the next, just, you know, cosmically, completely um, abandoned in darkness. Mm. Mm. Carl Jung and Marie-Louise en France, his student, had some quite interesting ideas about suicide, which they related to the anima, animus archetypes in uh, men and women. And that I think it's von Franz in um, Man and His Symbols, where she uh, she uses a Siberian folktale of a, a man who's lured across a river by a, a, a beautiful maiden, who then she, when he's, you know, he's taken all his clothes off and he swam across this cold river, um, she then turns into an owl and flies off and then he he's he's stuck on this river and then he drowns and she uses that as a a, a folk tale uh folk folkloric symbol of the the possession of the anima which in their terms was the sort of the quote-unquote feminine aspects of a man's psyche so you, you know that that would be broadly speaking um you know the kind of emotional uh aspect you know the the eros rather than the logos um and and that a man who's possessed by that within himself that 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 is too unconscious and i suppose this this comes back to an, a sense of emotional repression as well um it's quite compatible uh with that because the the, the whole the one of the fundamental points of their psychology was that what what is unconscious will end up driving the person if it's not rendered conscious so that that emotional emo, emotionality, you know, that those extremes of emotion that uh, that in their terms an anima possessed man will get into, um, will uh, in some cases actually drive him to suicide. Uh, it's interesting, synchronistically speaking, that you know that that particular Siberian folktale features an owl, which was a an animal that that my brother saw uh, in the daytime in his last few months which he found quite striking as an omen and uh, also the the river aspect of it as well um but but uh, yeah I, i'm i'm still working through as i said i was, I was I've, I've been writing this piece on suicide and um it, it's it's like this piece of string that i keep <laughs> i keep pulling on uh, and then you know there's more and more and more and it's quite it's quite challenging thing to write in itself anyway uh but it, it just it th there's so many different aspects to it but there there is something there i think that that's worth looking into um of that that sense of a, a 
a complete possession by that sort of intense emotionality whereas a, a a woman may find it much easier to render that emotional content conscious and verbalize it and you know articulate it very quickly uh, and then you know process it out it seems also that women uh, get over ptsd quicker than men which is an interesting one as well oh i didn't wasn't aware of that but it doesn't surprise me in a way um some of the factors we mentioned will have an effect on that, no doubt. But yeah, that's uh, that's a new one for me. Mm. Mm. I was reading a story. <clears throat> I'm about to do a an interview with the um, psychologist Steve Taylor about his new book, Extraordinary Awakenings, which is basically people who've had life changing events, basically transformation through trauma. I haven't read the book yet, so I don't know if any of these people came close to taking their own lives, but it's about how you can reach breaking point and break through. And he relates the story of um, <clears throat> Mark Lanigan, a musician, and uh, he was a member of the band the Screaming Trees back in the, I was never aware of them at the time, late 80s, early 90s, but he'd been a heavy drinker from when he was a young man. And then he got into heroin use and after the band split up, um, he basically became homeless for a while and he reached out to the depths of despair to the point like this, so many of the people that we're talking about, it just could, couldn't go on any longer. And, and the manifestation for him was, as, as he relates in his, his uh, memoir, was, I don't know if he was lying on the ground in some street or something, but he just looked up at the sky and said, God, change me. And, you know, and it happened for him, you know, um, and he's still here, been recording albums, as far as I know, he's been sober for many, many years. But it was, and you read about this, if you read the story of, I can't remember the guy's name, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and one of the guys that he worked closely with. And was it? The founder made it through, and he had that, he had that crying out to God moment, you know, mm. for help. And one guy he worked closely with later redescended into alcoholism and died, and that was just contrasting fates, you know. But I was just interested in reading about Mark Lanigan's story, and this is common with lots of people with heavy substance abuse. You know, that affects your psychology in itself. You know, you can end up in a, a suicidal position, not through any um, uh, previous psychological difficulties or even physical difficulties or anything, any life events, but simply through altering your, your physical and emotional and mental chemistry and makeup with, with substances, this is why they're to be treated with such um, reverence or care, and in some cases disdain. You know, what we, you know, the, these are all these. Are, I mention this again because when it comes to um, suicide cases, it's very common to have some kind of substance involved, not just in the suicide act itself or suicide attempt itself, uh, but in the you know the, in the lead up contributing to. Uh, sorry, adding to existing problems or creating problems where there were none already there. And when I talk about suicide attempts, by the way, it's worth mentioning that if there's getting on for a million suicides a year, there are between 10 to 20, I don't know why it's such a wide variation in the figures, between 10 to 20 million attempts that leave some kind of problems behind. Mm. Yes, uh, I mean, the, the, the addition of substances to an already kind of adult body and mind, you know, when when someone's going through depression, anxiety, trauma, and all the rest of it, a tiny a tiny toke on a spliff can send someone around the bend. You know, this is what happened to my brother. Um, that's a fairly extreme example, and that that's quite rare, I think. But it, it's certainly not uncommon that some form of sustained uh, abuse or or some you know very very cataclysmic individual experience in some cases and this is more the case with like the psychedelic family of drugs where some some really really intense trip has rewired someone uh and and they've they've not been able to integrate it fully um so yeah i mean these things as you say they they, they need our they need to be treated with a great deal of caution and respect um you know if they're 
dealt with at all um and that that's something that you know this this is applies to any 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 form of substance even coffee you know to some extent to a, a fairly mild comparatively but it can be it can caffeine can be a contributing factor to a psychotic episode in itself you know um well so. i don't know how much how much more time we've got left but i just wanted to throw in we were talking about uh, mind altering substances and i always sound a note of caution about antidepressants uh, because there are the, these things can cause a, a great deal of problems. Uh, the, the very fact that on many of the most wide, you know, most commonly used uh, branded antidepressant products that in the in the notes, the copious notes, you know, warning you of possible side effects, that the, pretty much the universal one is suicidal thoughts, seems rather curious, but. I would just caution anybody. I mean, lots of people will say, I can feel that I can almost feel the virtual pushback already. Antidepressants helped me immensely. They got me through this, that, and the other thing. Yes, that can happen. But I just know that antidepressants are not something to just be reached for like, like a bottle or like, you know, a spliff or whatever. They're not just something to be, um, it's not a route to go down without, without serious thought. And I think today, I'm just looking at the epidemic of problems with antidepressants, particularly in the US. These things are being prescribed like candy to even quite young children. And we're storing up enormous problems for the future. That's not, it's not an answer. There is no quick fix, you know? And antidepressants may be the bridge that someone can use to push through a situation. But yeah, just handle with care. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, something to, something that, that, can be applied as we you know you were saying earlier to um <clears throat> any mind altering substances really you know um uh, and yeah you know i had a <clears throat> an email today actually from someone who's interested in taking ayahuasca and they had heard that i'd you know was had some experience of psychedelics and were you know were asking me for my advice on that and i, I i've never taken ayahuasca uh, and you know at this point i'm not don't really feel too much inclination to do so so i just said you know look you know just take take things with care you know write down your experiences as much as you can um but beyond that i can't really can't really say i i, I can't i can't encourage or discourage anyone from doing these things i've had my own experimentations with you know um psychedelics and cannabis and things that we you know we we touched on in our email with jason um and those have been fairly mixed and you know we could probably do a whole other podcast about those yeah yeah oh, obviously a subject for another day really mm. oh well we yeah we're getting on to about an hour and a half so yes i'd say we covered a lot of ground there um it's been great really great to touch base with you again no, it's been wonderful. I just leave with the thought that uh, again, I <clears throat> I heard this on a online talk um, a few weeks ago, and then literally, um, I was just getting ready to do this chat with you, and I was listening to another talk, and exactly the same thought came up. So I don't know where it originates from, but if people, particularly people in, in a dark space, think about themselves, you know, as we all are, like in a way, like the sun, you know, and the things that pass by in life you know they never stay forever and they're like clouds and bad weather and pollution and these things can obscure the sun but they never touch it they never even come near it you know so we have a kind of like an inner an inner core an inner light whatever your worldview or cosmology is or whatever you think of life death and if there's anything beyond this physical realm there's something at the core of us that nothing else can touch that's always there you know and that's what we understand at the, we see it clearly in the best times in our lives, you know, those peak experiences at Faculty X. And as I mentioned earlier, that's accessible all the time. So just remember that those, the clouds, the pollution, all of that just blows past sooner or later. And that's not what we are and it can't touch us. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. I, I've been working through a book called The Cosmic Doctrine by Dion Fortune. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of that, that old esoteric, uh, maxim that as above so below that you know we, we are our own 
microcosmos. So, you know, that, that's always, always worth remembering for those who are having a, a rough time that there is a, you know, there is an internal sun that exerts its own gravitational pull and these things will pass.